uh, there was, and when he was growing up, they're really into football, and he grew up in the Bronx. In the Bronx. In the Bronx. Um, that's the, a weird accent back in there. In the South Bronx. That's in the South I, Bronx, so yeah. he's Southern. And um, <laughs> so he, <laughs> Southern, he grew up in this Jewish household with his grandmother and his grandfather, and the whole family <laughs> lived all in one. His cousins were up on this row, and they were there. And anyway, they played a lot of pickup ball and everything. In the 1960s, I believe, his hair was this big. <laughs> And he was a hippie, no, no, and we're, we're, but no, not smoking too much pot. The reason his name is Bake is there was a, um, and I'm going to get this wrong, there was a football player for the Jets, and his name was Bake Turner, and he had the same number as Ira Turner. Is that mm -hmm. correct? It was number 27? 29. 29. I'm getting it wrong. Anyway, <laughs> so um, there, he's been called Bake Turner since so he's 18 years old, So, but it gets confusing at meetings. Um, so he's um, uh, one of my best friends. I met him about... Um, almost 10 years ago at AHS, and he's been a huge supporter of me, like when the Board of Nursing and the Board of Medicine said, it, well, let's just shut her down. He, he fought for me hard, and he brought me to meet Roger Cady. I felt like I was going to see Don Carleon. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he introduced me to a lot of people, and um, when, whenever I wanted to get up, give up, and I've wanted to give up a, a lot, many, many times, he was one of the people saying, you cannot give up, you cannot give up, you cannot give up. And he's um, actually been doing neurology forever, and he's been uh, a headache specialist for a very, very long time. And he's been in clinical trials. Were you in the original sumatriptan trials? Yeah, most of them. Okay, so that's how old yeah. he is. Here he is. <laughs> Thank you. I have a lavalier, so I'll put this down. And it's really hard to believe, you know, growing up a Jewish kid in the Bronx back in the 50s, who would have ever thought that my best friend later in life would be some woman from Mississippi? I mean, that's how, that's how strange the world has become. You know, we're, we're getting closer and closer. But let's get on to, the, to what we're talking about here. Uh, I have two statements I would just like to make. And if anybody disagrees with them, I'd love you to you know, just chime in and we could fight it out then. Number one, not every migraine patient is the same. Anybody disagree? I think we could all agree on that. Number two, not every migraine in the same patient is the same. So what do we often see? We often have patients tell us, yeah, that medicine that you gave me for my attack, it works great most of the time. But what happens when it doesn't work? What happens when the medicine that usually was effective didn't work? And it's 12 hours later, 24 hours later, 48 hours later, 72 hours later, and the patient is still in the midst of an attack. Just so you don't think I'm biased, here are my disclosures. Uh, I like to show this to prove I'm not biased, that I'm willing to take money from anybody who wants to give it to me. Uh, but that's the way I, I, I avoid bias, I think, because I work with every single company that has a migraine product out there. So I really can't favor one over the other. And uh, I have no problem with this. I hope you guys don't. And the other disclosure is almost everything I'm going to talk about is off-label. And uh, frankly, there are two things, I think. I was looking at my, the slide deck just last night, and I was saying to myself, what, 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 what am I going to talk about that is on label? There actually are two things I'm going to mention. So no headache specialists, actually no neurologists, but anybody who's, who's not a headache specialist or neurologist, I'll challenge you at the end to point out to me the two things that I mentioned that in fact were on label. Okay. But, you know, if, if anybody's ever looked at the FDA's website and there's a section on off-label promotion, and you know the pharmaceutical companies are not allowed to promote off-label. But we do it every day in our office. You know, you can't take care of a patient by just strictly staying on label. Most of what we do is frankly off label. And even the FDA says that sometimes the best treatment for a medical condition is a treatment that's approved for another disorder. Okay? So even the FDA does not want us to not use stuff off label, they just don't want it to be promoted commercially off-label. It's what we call using your best judgment. And that's what we need to do. We need to always do what's best for our patient. So, we also like to practice evidence-based medicine. We preach this all the time to our residents and to the students, and even, even to our patients. 
whenever a patient asks me, do you believe this? Do you believe this works? Do you believe that works? My usual response, and I try to be nice about this and be careful who I say it to, is belief is not a medical or a scientific term. It's a religious or a philosophical term. Show me the evidence. Now, unfortunately, sometimes there is no evidence. Sometimes you just have to go based on your experience, which is not the best way to do things. But lack of evidence does not equate with lack of efficacy. This is something that, that we learned many, many years ago. Sometimes stuff, you just find out that it works, or you have a teacher who taught you that this works. Not the best way, perhaps, if we had, if we had a good evidence base, but very often we don't. And John Ed Meads, who unfortunately died quite a few years ago, ran a headache center up in Toronto, and he was a phenomenal speaker. I think uh, most of us who have gray hair probably remember who, who he was. But this was a quote from him. He who practices strictly experience-based medicine is doomed to repeat the mistakes over and over again, while he who practices strictly evidence-based medicine is doomed to repeat the mistakes of others over and over again. So you have to have the right balance. Where there's lots of evidence for something that has been really proven to work, great. But where there isn't much evidence, then you have to go based on your experience or the experience of others who you can turn to for advice. And you know, growing up in the South Bronx, I used to walk to Yankee Stadium, and this was back in the early 50s when I was a kid. And two of my heroes were Yogi Berra and, and Casey Stengel, who was the manager of the Yankees. And these two made a complete mess of the English language. It was amazing if you understood anything that they ever said. But Yogi always had these great quotes. Half of them, I think, he never said. But this was always one of my favorites. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Now, in medicine, sometimes we have a choice. We can go this way or that way, and we don't have enough evidence to say, say which, which way is the better way for a particular situation. So we have to do it based on our experience and make a decision. The worst thing that we could do is tell a patient, oh, I don't know what to do for you. Okay. Well, that's okay if you have somebody next, right, right nearby who you could send them to. But a lot of times you're in a situation where you just got to make a decision. You got to take the fork, okay? Take one of the branches of the fork anyway. Okay, so here's a case report. This actually was a real patient of mine. I didn't make this one up. Uh, Lena, 32-year-old female, had a, a history of migraine without aura since age 16, usually responsive to 100 milligrams of sumatriptan. And she really was doing well for years and years and years. Once in a while, she'd tell me, yeah, well, sometimes it worked better than others, but overall, it worked great for her most of the time. She'd occasionally need to rescue with six milligrams of sumatriptan. This is a common scenario. You know? So for example, say she took the 100 milligram dose, but she was already nauseated when she took it. So maybe it didn't get absorbed as quickly. You know, don't forget, we get gastric stasis during a migraine very commonly, and that goes along with the nausea. That's why we want people to treat early for their acute treatments. So she would occasionally need to use a non-oral rescue. And for her, sumatriptan worked fantastically. By the way, uh, as you can tell, I've been around for a long time. And as Christina told you, I was involved in a lot of the early sumatriptan studies. This changed my life. I've never canceled office hours because of a migraine since sumatriptan was first marketed in 1993 in this country. That's how good it is. Before that, I used to have days where I would have to cancel office hours or patients would say, hey, doc, you look worse than I do. What the hell are you doing here? Why don't you go home? And it was true, okay? But it never canceled office hours since then. So we've got, we've got good tools out there. We've just got to use them at the right time and for the right patient. So this time, Lena tells me, and this was you know, relatively early in the day, I had a headache for three days. It didn't, none of my medicines worked. Okay. Doesn't happen that often. To me, only once or twice a day. Um, but it does have, if you see enough patients, you start to see a lot of this. So she had gone to the emergency room the day before and was treated with an anti-emetic and an intramuscular opiate. Um, she had this experience before. Okay, this is not unusual. They would always seem to treat her the same way. And she was discharged after some improvement, 
And uh, of course, another negative non-contrast CT. She was, I forget how many CTs she had had by this point, but it was, it was really beyond the absurd point. Uh, you, know, you think that we're radiating a brain tumor uh, with the number of CT scans that she had. And two hours after the treatment, the headache recurred. It was more severe than it was before they gave her the opiate. And she had more, no more nausea and vomiting. She was unable to sleep all night. She calls in the morning. And don't forget, this is already three days into it. So she really was right on the border of qualifying for, in a clinical trial, that would have been status migranosis. What to do? Very, very, oh, this is not Lena, OK? <laughs> this is Lulu. Lu Lulu has a habit of crashing my talks all the time. And uh, you know, Lulu obviously has a migraine. I mean, look at, that, look at that position. If you saw somebody laying like that outside, you would think, she just got a migraine. At least I would. Now, my daughter's a veterinarian, and I always used to tease her. What, do, what does she do? How does she treat migraine in her animals? Okay. She'd say, Dad, migraine doesn't occur in animals. I just tell you, yeah, you're not taking enough history. You've got to spend more time <laughs> talking to your animals, especially those dogs. I know that dogs get migraine. I've, I've seen dogs have migraine. I'm positive I've seen dogs have migraine. And she would just laugh and laugh and laugh. And then a few years ago, she. <laughs> She sent me this, this article from one of the British veterinary journals. <laughs> and uh, it's a beautiful description of a dog who had a migraine, laying in the corner, in the dark, had vomited, was withdrawing. I don't know if he complained of headache or not, but I think you know, dogs, they, they communicate with us in nonverbal non ways. Uh, and a few hours later, he was fine. And this was happening over and over again. So they put the dog onto pyramate, and then it never happened again. So I'm convinced it does have, we know we've got experimental models in rodents of migraine. You know, so we, you know, it, we're not the only species that gets this. Okay, so what about Lena's options? Not Lulu. Lulu's just going to sleep in the shade. Or I, hope, I hope she gets off that, that rock in the sun and goes off in the shade somewhere. Um, what are the options? One, do nothing. Well, that's not acceptable, right? The other one is retry what was already tried. Well, already failed. Why would you want to do it again at this point when the patient clear, clearly has central sensitization? Is, you know, oral medicines are not likely to work. Go to the ER. I hate the ER. I hear this all the time. Are there any ER people here, by the way? I know we had one last year. Um, it's not that they, you know, they're, they're trying to mistreat these patients, but the patients feel that way. Um, so I said, come into the office. We'll either do nerve blocks or give you, put you in our infusion suite and uh, give you some intravenous therapy. She said, I'm on the way. So she came in, had a, one of our nurses start an IV in the infusion suite. Nice, quiet room, reclining chair, adjustable lights. Um, and she said, should I give her the full Monty? That's the nickname that, the, that my nurse has given for what, what seems to be our most commonly used cocktail. Okay, well, obviously we alter it for you know, different clinical situations. So this, this is what we do for, for most patients, unless there's a medical contraindication. Catorolac, 30 milligrams IV push, diphenhydramine. Now we know that diphenhydramine doesn't work for migraine. So why do I give it to patients? Well, it's for the next drug, metoclopramide. If I gave metoclopramide, Without diphenhydramine, my nurses would shoot me or walk out. Because what happens a lot, of, what's the most common side effect of metoclopramide? It's acathesias. They can't sit still. They're like me. You know, they're walking around, pacing around. They always threaten to give me Benadryl, uh, you know, in the office. Um, but it really, it doesn't help the migraine, but it helps avoid a common side effect of metoclopramide or, uh, you know, say we use uh, Compazine instead. I know I'm not supposed to use brand names, but it's just so much easier for, you know, in some situations. Got to give them some Benadryl before that. Um, a lot of people say, well, why not use Ondansetron? It's a better anti-emetic. And it is. Yeah, I think it is a better anti-emetic. But these two drugs, have, uh, Prochlorperazine and, uh, and Metoclopramide, also have an anti-migraine effect. They work against a lot, uh, they work on all of the symptoms of migraine. Mag sulfate. This is interesting. My, you know, my, 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 my friend and colleague, Alex Mauskopf, who I think some of you may have heard of, uh, Alex is, is one of the people who really has 
push the use of mag sulfate in a lot of these patients, both orally and uh, intravenously. As a matter of fact, whenever one of his patients moves from Manhattan out to Long Island, I usually wind up seeing them. And they always tell me, if I'm really bad, can you just give me, a, you know, just, start, just give me some mag magnesium sulfate? It works all the time. And I say, if you're really bad, we're going to give you a little more than magnesium sulfate. But I understand everybody who walks into his office practically gets some IV mag sulfate, just give an IV push. And it works, but there are no studies on it, really. And uh, I, you know, I, I think that it, it's really been helpful to, to quite a few patients. But the data on it is not that great. There's some evidence, about level B evidence, uh, which is fine. Dexamethasone. Now, I know so, everyone going to tell me there's no, I know Christina tells me this all the time, there are no studies that show that steroids work in this situation. And she's right. So why do we do it? Dexamethasone has been shown to reduce recurrence. Because if you just give them this other stuff and they come back, you know, six hours later or the next morning, you've helped them a little bit, but not enough. Dexamethasone really does help reduce recurrence. And I, you know, the data on that is just for IV. I don't know if it really works orally, although anecdotally I've heard some patients it does seem to help reduce recurrence. But intravenously, it does seem to help. And the dosage range is somewhere between 16 and 24 milligrams in the studies that showed that it did help reduce recurrence. Results, she was pain-free. She was actually pain-free in an hour, okay? And this is somebody who was really sick for three days now. Nausea and vomiting, which was, her, um, which, which was her most bothersome symptom next to headache, gone. Photophonophobia was gone. She wasn't drowsy. One of the things we always worry about using uh, metoclopramide and Benadryl is going to cause drowsiness. And it can. It certainly, it certainly can. Uh, but she was fine. Um, she had no abdominal pain. I mean, when I first started doing this, I was really afraid of using the combination of catorolac and dexamethasone. Um, I would use one and usually not the other. And then after a while, we just started using both out of desperation. And I, I would say it's only a matter of time before we get a bad GI bleed from these. Even though we're giving them IV, it's really not a great combination. I'll show you some data on this in, in a little while. She felt so good she drove herself home. I asked her to give us a follow-up call the next morning. She called. Actually, as soon as the phones went on in the morning, she called. And she said to me, uh, hey, I'm fine. I'm going to work. So in the past, you know, when she would have an episode like this, uh, and it didn't happen often, very, you know, fortunately, she would wind up out of work for a few days, uh, which is really almost as bad as the headache itself is. The time people be, miss from work, from family activities, from social activities. Who else has, has migraine here besides me, by the way? Yeah, it's usually more than half of an audience, especially at a headache meeting. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, and if I went around and I asked people a little bit about their headaches, I suspect a lot of them you know, have migraine who, just, who still have, you know, admitted to yourselves that you have migraine. I almost missed my oldest son's college graduation because I had a, re a real whopping migraine the morning, the morning that it occurred. But fortunately, I had some injectable sumatriptan, and I gave myself a shot, and I managed to make it, make it there. Reasons why I hate the ER. I hear this all the time. You know, Christina, what I'd like to do next year, if you invite me back, uh, is uh, have an ER doctor to uh, maybe have a discussion with me after the... Uh, after the talk, yeah, yeah. Well, that that would be that would be great, you know, because they may have a very different perspective, you know. And I, well, okay, okay. And there might be a nice a nice way to to talk about it because I don't have all the answers. Certainly, not everything that we do works. But I'd love to sit down. You know, I, I have a lot of ER doctors who admit to me that they have no idea how to treat migraine. Their idea of a good, what's a, an ER doctor's idea of a good outcome, by the way? Patient leaves the emergency room. Alive. Alive. Not, not necessarily. You know, <laughs> you know, two hours they want them out of the emergency room. Okay. And, and this is a problem because their perspective is different. They don't, they, they're not that interested from a, um, from what they're doing at the time is how the patient's going to be six hours from now or six days from now. You know, so I think we could do a lot uh, by, by talking to a, lo a lot of them in the, at the same time. And that's also why I think the algorithm, because if they only have time yeah. to see the patient, you can easily diagnose in the first place. And then the second case, you can 
<laughs> so these are the reasons why patients say they hate the ER. What, number one is long wait. What's the worst thing you can do to, to a patient in the midst of a really bad migraine where they can't stand the light, they can't stand the noise, they're nauseated, they can't stand the odors, okay, and you're going to make them wait for four or five hours. You, you did that, right? <laughs> That's right. And it's the biggest university hospitals where you see that problem the most. Community hospitals are not quite as bad, but they're pretty close to it. Uh, but the thing is, they, they, they get treated like they're a drug seeker, and then they're given an opioid. Does this make any sense? They're sitting there for hours, and, they pay, and uh, they're treated like they're, they're looking for an opioid, and then they're given one. And the patients, after a while, start to figure this out. Um, that these don't work that great because they do work very temporarily and then the patient gets sent home and, they get, and, they, and they're worse when they get home. Yes, Nate? A lot of patients even say, don't take Yes, the exactly. They still get them. They still get them. And, and you know what? I, I, I almost understand why they do it because we're not getting the message across to emergency rooms about how to treat a refractory migraine. Okay, I'm not talking about somebody who's got a headache every day for five years. I'm talking about somebody with a usual attack of migraine that didn't respond to their usual treatment. The last thing we want to do is give these patients drugs that may make them worse, even if it makes them temporarily better. Because there's lots of evidence now that shows that if you give a patient like this an opioid or a combination drug with obituate, they may very well become refractory to the more potentially more migraine-specific medications. Very interesting. Injectable sumatriptan became available in this country in 1993, a year or two before that in Europe, or I should say in Britain at least. Um, there have been four big review articles in the last, uh, over the last, uh, what's it, close to 25 years now, uh, since the introduction of injectable sumatriptan on treatment of migraine in the emergency room. What's the number one treatment in all one of the early studies? It's opiates. Yeah, you know, it's, it, 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 you know, every emergency room seems to have their own favorite opioid. And, you know, I think there are, there are occasional cases where, you, where I could understand it. You know, if somebody comes in with really bad coronary artery disease and, you know, a million contraindications to, you know, to, to either, either triptans or ergots or non-steroidals. All right, I, I could see an occasional, but this is the number one treatment for patients who come into an emergency room with a bad migraine around the country. Yes? Yes. Well, she's the, she was the first author on the, what, the headache issue and second author on the, on the cephalalgia. Mia Meenan is a, is a real sweetheart. She's a young headache specialist at NYU. She doesn't see a lot of patients, but she does a phenomenal job on doing these epidemiological studies and in teaching the, you know, the residents there. Sure. Are you trying to give my topic away? <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, a lot of the patients call it call a migraine cocktail, and every every they're all different. You know, for example, I, I gave you a list of medications that that are my nurses' favorites because this is what's worked out the best for them. But if it's a diabetic, I'm not giving him dexamethasone. You know, if they've had a problem with movement disorders, I'm not likely to give them metoclopramide. Or if they've had, you know, mul multiple GI bleeds in, bleeds in the past, I'm not going to give them either dexamethasone or ketorolec. Although dexamethasone IV might be okay. I remember when I was a first-year neurology resident, uh, one of my first nights on call, I had a patient with, who came into the e ER with an, with an enormous acute subdural. And I called the neurosurgeon resident who called his attending. The attending, you know, say, says to me, uh, give, him, give him 16 milligrams of dexamethasone right now. I said to him, Aren't you worried it's going to cause a GI bleed? You know, I was a first-year neurology resident. All these things are the things that bother you when you're, when you're a young resident. He said, Sonny, 
Dexamethasone doesn't cause GI bleeds. Neurosurgery causes GI bleeds. Give him the, de give him the dexamethasone. And uh, he, 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 was a great, he was a great teacher, by the way, but that's the way, that's the way he talked to us. Okay, let's get back to where we were. Okay, average cost. At our infusion center at Island Neurological, the average cost, and this is a few years old, but I don't think it's changed much. If anything, it's gone down because, you know, insurance reimbursements never go up these days. Uh, it's 250 to $400 for average time, an hour to an hour and a half in our infusion suite. Average cost in an emergency room on Long Island is over $2,500. And uh, yeah, sometimes way more than that. You know, some people, you know, they get multiple imaging studies, they get a, mi a million unnecessary consults. Uh, all they need to do most of the time is just take a history. Um, so it's, it's so much less expensive and so much more efficient and so much more palatable to the patient to be treated in an infusion suite in a comfortable setting than to go to the emergency room, which by definition is never comfortable for a migraine patient. What works? This is a nice review article in 2012 by Peter Goldsby and Amy Gelfrand. And uh, these are the things that, that they found uh, to be either effective or less effective. Hydration, they felt is really underappreciated. I think this is really important to someone who's had a migraine that's gone on for a few days, especially with nausea and vomiting, because they're dehydrated. And that's going to make, make it even take longer for them to get better. They felt opioids were less effective and impaired the effectiveness of acute and prophylactic medications. I think this is something that's still unrecognized by a lot of people. You give opioids to patients with migraine and their usual acute and preventive medications become less effective. And there's at least some evidence that it might contribute to the transformation to chronic migraine and medication overuse. Antidopaminergics they felt were very useful, particularly if there's a lot of nausea and vomiting. Triptans, of course, sumatriptan, sub-Q, and the nasal sprays are usually. You want to avoid oral medications in these people. They've got gastric stasis. They tell you that because, you know, you, most of the time they're, they're, very, uh, they're very happy to oblige you to, and throw up right in front of you. This is you know, a very common occurrence when people come in in this state. We have a lot of buckets in our infusion suite just in case. Um, DHE, you know, dihydroergotamine. This is a product that I grew up with back when I was training, back in the early 70s when I was a resident. You know, we didn't have triptans back then, but we had ergots. Uh, and um, plain ergotamine was a much more difficult to tolerate. It worked great for the pain, but it made patients really puke their guts out. I know I took it myself a few times, and, you know, it was, it was ne never fun to take it, but to get rid of the headache. DHE, when given intravenously plus an antiemetic, was a really effective treatment. And sometimes I'll add this to the mix. If, if my original cocktail didn't work out so well, and if the patient is not you know, using an enormous number of triptans or other ergots at the time, the, you know, we're, we're told that we're not supposed to mix the ergots and triptans, so I'm not going to recommend that you do it. It clearly says it's contraindicated. Um, 24, hours. 20, 24 hours either way, right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what does work? Okay, well, they felt acutely non-steroidals given intravenously were useful, and, and Ketorolax, the one we use mostly in this country, and many other countries, intravenous aspirin is available and works really well. Um, and, and even orally aspirin works really well if you could take it before you get nauseated. Um, so it would be a great treatment to have in this country. Um, Remore, is, is intravenous aspirin used a lot in Denmark? No? Uh, in Germany, yeah. I, I knew there were a few European countries where... where yeah. Well, we have that. It does occasionally work, and I'll, I'll mention that in a little while. Valproate. You know, the data on this is, is not really great, but certainly anecdotally and based on my own experience, there are lots of people who do great with IV valproate. Uh, of course, you want to be sure it's a young woman, which it often is that they're not, not, not pregnant. Um, so that, that's something to keep an eye on. Corticosteroids. Uh, again, we mentioned this previously. There's not much evidence that they work by any route of administration to abort the attack. But there is evidence that they reduce recurrence 
after you get the patient better. I know even uh, a lot of my partners and a lot of my colleagues, they call, if somebody calls them up and say, oh, I've had two or three days of migraine, it won't break, they'll send in a, send in a prescription for methylprednisolone. Uh, and patients say it works. My, my, own, my own personal feeling is the migraine would have ended anyway at that time. Don't forget, migraine gets better. Okay? There's no evidence that any of those treatments work, but they're commonly used. Might there be an occasional patient where it's useful? Maybe. Max sulfate, uh, I like to use max sulfate in most of my patients who come in in status migranosis. I use it a lot in our pregnant patients. You know, all you gotta do is speak to an obstetrician occasionally, you know, you, you, you can't give them anything other than max sulfate and Tylenol, uh, and hydration, of course. But I think it, it does play, or, uh, it does, you know, there's certainly some evidence it works. So what are some of the options we had? Non-steroidals in this country, the only one we have is Ketorolax, got level B evidence. Uh, antihistamines, none of them have any evidence of efficacy, but we use diphenhydramine quite a bit, mostly to avoid the side effects of the antiemetics, particularly metoclopramide or proclopredazine. Uh, Ondansetron uh, has no evidence of efficacy for migraine, but we know it's a good antiemetic. So if they don't, in the past, didn't tolerate metoclopramide or proclopredazine, they developed some dystonic reactions or something. Ondansetron's got a much lower incidence of that, so we often will use that if the nausea is sometimes a bigger issue than the, than the headache is. Max sulfate, again, level B evidence. We give it over 20 to 30 minutes. Alex Mousecup likes to give it by IV push over a minute or two. Uh, my nurses are, you know, they, they're very hesitant to use it. I suggested trying it a few times, but they say, no, no, this works great. So I, I learned a long time ago when my nurses tell me something that works great, I don't fight with them. I say, you, you know, if, that, if that, your experience is working great, no side effects, we're going to do it that way. That's why everybody gets Benadryl, I should say diphenhydramine, when they get an antiemetic in our office. Steroids, again, dexamethasone has level C evidence for reducing recurrence. Uh, methylprednisolone is interesting, and this is purely anecdotal. There is no evidence to back this up. One of my partners, Steve Newman, is an MS specialist. And we had done a, a study several years ago on the incidence of migraine in his MS population. It was close to 30%. So he sees a lot of migraine. And he often sees attacks of migraine when people have relapses of their MS. And how do you treat a relapse of MS? You give him a gram of methylprednisolone intravenously, right? And you'll do it for anywhere from three to five days. He, he tells me that when his patients with MS come in with a bad migraine, he gives them a gram of, uh, of intravenous methylprednisolone, and it works almost every single time. Uh, Again, this is not a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. The evidence does not support it. But this is also a much higher dose of methylprednisolone than you would probably use it ordinarily use in your office or even that they would use in the emergency room, saying they were treating an asthmatic. Okay. Yes? Yeah. Uh, that was a, that was exactly the point I made in that in that slide with the four studies showing opiates. So you, that should be the first. Yeah, uh, unless they've already tried a few doses and it didn't work. Yeah, but that but I agree. I mean, I think it's shocking that it's not being used. Yeah, DHE. It's got level B evidence. It probably would be level A evidence if it wasn't, uh, at this point, a generic drug. Uh, back when it was branded, they didn't do the clinical trials uh, like we do today. There was only one randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study that was done. So it has level B evidence rather than level A evidence. But in my mind, it's just as effective as any other treatment that, that we use. Poorly tolerated in terms of nausea and vomiting, so you do have to give an antiemetic with this. And um, 
Very well, you know, as long as you don't overuse this drug, it's really a very effective uh, treatment to have in your therapeutic arsenal. And I'm looking forward to, to maybe finding, you know, using it in some other way. A lot of my colleagues don't like to give it IV because of nausea and vomiting. And there is some evidence that giving it subcutaneously, you have much less nausea and vomiting. Uh, this was our go-to drug back in, back in the pre-triptan era. And uh, I've always used it intravenously because that's the way I was taught to use it. But the more I listen to some of my colleagues, maybe giving it sub-Q, uh, it might work, uh, be a lot better tolerated, uh, particularly for patients who are going to use it at home. You know, we have a, a little tiny number of patients who will inject the DHE sub-Q at home. And most of them do it IM because that's how they were taught to do it. But with IM, you still get a lot of nausea and vomiting. Sub-Q, you get, it seems that there's much less nausea and vomiting with it. And the intranasal route might turn out to be a pretty a nice alternative also, provided they can come up with a way of doing it that doesn't cause so much nasal mucosa irritation that patients can't stand it. Okay, so what are the other options? Sodium valproate, the, the evidence level is only C, but most headache specialists who have infusion suites tend to agree with me that stuff works. Okay, so if my Fulmanti that, uh, or, uh, or, or cocktail doesn't work, the usual question that one of the nurses says to me is, should we give, should we give her sodium valproate now? I said, you sure not? she's not pregnant? They say, yes, we're sure she's not pregnant. Uh, okay, go right ahead, and it, it is, a, in my opinion, a very effective treatment. Caffeine, sodium, benzoate. You know, I've, we've had a lot of luck with this in post-spinal headaches. It's transient, but it, it at least gets patients better for a while, and I, particularly if they have a prior history of migraine. Ian, have you had uh, you know, much uh, use for caffeine, sodium, benzoate in any of your patients with the low-pressure headaches? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that, that, and that's one of the troubles with some of these treatments is we're giving so many of them. You're giving hydration, you're giving caffeine. Which is the more important one? Well, the answer is yes. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, Eric. It's still available? Uh, yes. I it, yeah. Yeah, we have. We have. I'm not sure whether it yeah. was one of those ubiquitous shortages. You can get it. We get. We have it in the office. Yeah, you, you can get it locally. Yes. Yeah. It, it, there's a, sometimes there are there are shortages of that. We've had times where for a few weeks we couldn't get it. So I I always have tell my nurses, look, it's not that expensive. Let's stock it. If it expires, so what? You know. It, you know. Just just so we have it. Because, you know, before, I have trouble on Long Island, for whatever reason, getting anesthesiologists to do blood patches. They don't want to do it unless they did it, unless they caused the blood patch. Then they're willing to do it. But most of them just don't want to do it. So we do the best we can in the meantime. We'll bring them, bring them into the infusion so we hydrate the hell out of them, give them caffeine, and, and it often works. IV acetaminophen. Uh, this is really interesting. There aren't many good studies on it, but now that we have it available in this country, especially in people who can't tolerate non-steroidals or um, you know, have contraindications to a lot of the other medications, we do sometimes use it. Very expensive, uh, but hey, it works sometimes when other stuff doesn't work. No evidence uh, based on studies. Ket ketamine, ketamine. Lot, there are lots of anecdotes about this, and I know there are people out there who are using it quite, quite a bit. I don't use it because I don't have an anesthesiologist, and I'm very uncomfortable doing it you know, in our office as an outpatient without an anesthesiologist around. Same thing with propofol. Uh, propofol, you know, if you put some of these patients to sleep with propofol and they wake up great. I had one patient in status migranosis who went for a colonoscopy. <laughs> And it was given propofol for the anesthesia, and he woke up with no headache afterwards. Now, I don't know if it was the colonoscopy or the propofol, but I've heard anecdotes about this, but you really need an anesthesiologist there. Yes? No, and that's probably true. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but, but putting people to sleep sometimes, I don't know if any of you ever heard of Dave Codden, 
Uh, Dave was a headache, uh, he was a general neurologist who did a lot of headache at Mount Sinai in New York. And he had his office on Park Avenue, so he had a really interesting group of patients. And I met him when I first went into practice back in the mid-70s. And Dave never published even one article in his entire life. But everybody in the Northeast knew Dave because he had his sleep therapy program where he would put people in the hospital for, e for anywhere from three to seven days and literally have them asleep with the aid of an anesthesiologist. And the patients swore that this was the most wonderful treatment they ever had for when they had a refractory migraine. Now I've seen over the, I saw it over the years after Dave retired and he subsequently unfortunately died several years ago. Um, I've seen a lot of his former patients and they to this day swear that that was the best treatment that they ever got. But they've never did any studies, never published even one article, and had, had a vast experience with using this stuff. But don't forget, experience-based medicine it's, you know, it, it, there are so many pitfalls that you have with it, and I certainly don't feel comfortable doing it, but you're gonna hear patients out there, especially some people, some patients who are of my age, who maybe were patients of Dave's. Yeah. Are you in the Dov Pearson In the what? Dov No. <laughs> nope, I was not. <laughs> But hey, patients ask about that all the time. It, and, but that's a preventive treatment, really, more than an acute patient treatment. Yeah, that's what I always say, show me the data. OK, this is the way we, you know, we, we don't use a 10-point scale usually in our office because, frankly, I'm, a, I'm just an old country neurologist. And I, I can't tell the difference between a 6 and a 7. And uh, I like to use the same number and we use in acute clinical trials, mild, moderate, severe, or none. Okay, and that's what I've taught my nurses to use when they evaluate these patients coming in. And we collected lots of data, and we use this scale, this four-point scale, not just for headache intensity, but for nausea, for vomiting, for light and noise sensitivity. And we have them, you know, fill out their questionnaire, right, you know, as soon as they come in, while they're starting the IV, and then as they're about to go home, see what the difference is. And we presented uh, this, this data uh, back about four years ago in, in San Diego. And you could see here that with all four parameters that we were measuring, there was a substantial decrease. 95% um, of patients improved significantly with one of these treatments. Okay, and it was usually the, the first one I showed you, the full Monte. Yeah, I, I, look, we're not really doing a clinical trial. This is just how we care for our patients. And I don't think that there's any one treatment that's necessarily the best. You have to individualize it for some patients. And that's, that's why I always try to teach the residents, do what's best for your patient, talk to them, don't be rigid in, in your thinking. Because like I said, if I have a diabetic, I'm not likely to give them dexamethasone. I'd rather not. Have I? Yeah, but I usually when, when, I, when I was forced to, because they had prior history of it coming back right away the next day, then I might do it. If I have them see their, their, you know, their primary care doctor or endocrinologist to really get the diabetes back in shape after I messed it up for them. We did a, a three-year study. The, the following year, we had three years' worth of data. Uh, we had over 500 treatments and that, and we saw the same thing. So we were having about a 95% success rate. Small number don't get better. We had one patient who got worse. That was one of my partner's patients who he told me in advance, nothing's going to work on this patient. Uh, and nothing did work on this patient. She was, she was a patient who no matter what you did, she would tell you it made her worse. So that, that's clearly an outlier. Treatment emergent adverse events. Just pay attention to these. They're really not that big, but they're all man. Drowsiness is the big one because sometimes they can't drive themselves home. Now, most of them can't drive themselves there. Okay, so they already had it. Somebody drove them there. Uh, or worse comes to worse, they struggled, they got themselves there. And then if they're drowsy after treatment, we're not going to let them drive themselves home. We have them call a taxi or an Uber or, or somebody uh, from the family to come and pick them up. Yes? How often do you have to deal with the vanishing tail light signs? Jason gets dropped off on your door. Yes, and they're gone. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, not that often, but of course, very, very often. Um, I, I can't remember the last time we had somebody stranded. Uh, but of course, what we usually do is most of these patients really can drive them. About ha more than half can drive themselves home without any difficulty at all. Our nurses are pretty good judges of that. They've they got a lot of experience. Uh, but you really do have to be a little careful about it, and sometimes they have to stay there a little longer and read a book or something, uh, or, watch, or watch TV. We do have a TV in there, and uh, if, as long as they don't turn the volume up too loud, it's, it's okay. Uh, we're not seeing um, as much acathesias as we used to see since we've been giving uh, diphenhydramine to almost everybody. Increased nausea is very uncommon. I've had a few patients who called back said they had insomnia after the treatment. I suspect that might be from the dexamethasone more than anything else, but uh, no abdominal pains, no GI bleeds. And this is what we were the most scared about when we first started doing this several years back. Um, you know, I, and, and it always reminds me of what that neurosurgeon said to me, that steroids don't cause GI bleeds, neurosurgeons cause GI bleeds. I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that too seriously, by the way. Steroids can cause GI bleeds, especially in people who are also on non-steroidals. What are the advantages of doing it? Number one, rapid evaluation and treatment. You've already got the history on these patients. You've got a chart there on them. Um, can control sensory stimulation. Comfort. Certainly, a reclining chair is much more comfortable than a stretcher in the emergency room. Medical records are right there. You don't have to spend a lot of time trying to track down medical records um, from, uh, from some outside facility. And you can customize it according to the patient's comorbidities and what they've experienced in the past. And it's a hell of a lot cheaper than going to the emergency room. Disadvantage, there are always disadvantages. Uh, unexpected medication reactions. They're pretty rare, but you have to be prepared for it. We have excellent nurses. Um, two of them, uh, well, one of them had years and years of home nursing experience, uh, home IV infusion experience. Another one was an ICU nurse, and another one had worked at an infusion center for many, many years. So, they, they, you know, we have well-trained people, but that costs you money. Very hard for somebody in solo practice to set up something, something like this. Driving home, yeah, it's an issue for some people, but fortunately, we, we seem to always manage to get people home safely. Obtaining and stocking medicines. You gotta have this stuff there. You can't just, you know, call up and try and get it from the pharmacy. You know, it's gotta be right there in the infusions we're ready to use. And it's also not meant for unknown patients. Yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to take, you know, to, 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 to if, if another neurologist calls me up and say, hey, I got a patient that I'd like you to see today if possible, you really, that's fine, but it's not for this. I, you know, I wanna be able to make sure that I've really got a migraine patient who I'm doing this on. Um, so it's not meant for, un, for unknown patients. And there's little evidence. This is mostly experience-based. Yes, there's some evidence for some treatments. A lot of experience. You know, we've been doing this stuff now for quite a long time. Other options. This is not the only treatment. Again, you know, we always try to individualize treatments for patients. Nerve blocks work really well. Occipital nerve blocks are very effective for a lot of these patients for acute treatment. Um, we, I usually, since in New York State, we seem, we seem to be unable to get paid for doing occipital nerve blocks for migraine, but we do get paid for, for, for trigeminal branch blocks, so we usually do both. Um, you know, the evidence base is kind of weak, but certainly there are enough studies that suggest that it's a very effective treatment, that there's no reason insurance companies are refusing to pay for these. Sphenopalatin ganglion blocks, I'm not very good at these. My nurse practitioner is super. She does such a great job with them that my, my staff won't even let me do that and let, do them unless, unless, she's, you know, unless she's the one. If she was on maternity leave, we didn't do too many of these. Um, trigger point injections are very helpful for people who are also having a lot of cervical muscle spasm. It gives them some temporary relief for that. Are the, is the intravenous CGRP monoclonal antibody, epitizumab, going to be useful in this scenario? Uh, you know, there is going to be an acute treatment that's going to be starting shortly for this drug, and I, we're, we're going to be in, uh, participating, and of course we have an IV infusion suite. Is this going to be a useful treatment for somebody like this, not somebody who you're going to treat very quickly after the onset of the migraine? Someone where, where it's been going on for two or three or four days or a week, 
uh, is, it, will it work for somebody like that? I don't know. But I, I, I certainly might consider trying it in a few patients, especially if the acute study that's going to be done turns out to be an effective therapy. Why not use it you know, in people uh, in status migranosis like this? You bring them in, you infuse it. How long does it take to kick in? We don't know the answer to that. Okay, there is some evidence that it's working within a few hours. So maybe it might be an acute ther therapy. How about some of these neuromodulating devices that Heather showed you the, this morning? We haven't done much of this. We, we've done uh, with the non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator. We've had a few patients who, you know, who we had them try it while they were there. Mixed results. Uh, but again, these are really bad patients, so I wouldn't expect to get dramatic results with any of these, but I may be wrong. Maybe we're not doing it the right way. Maybe, maybe you need to stimulate both sides, okay? Or maybe the, you know, the, more, the remote one on the arm might work better, or I haven't had much luck with the, with the, um, with the superorbital nerve stimulators, but you know, th these, are, these are kind of things that you always wonder about. Why not try these things and do real studies? On? It's tough to find the patients. That's always the problem. That's why ex the experience base is way better than, than the, the, the real database that we have. Um, so yeah, based on experience, I think we will try and do some of these. Here's my staff, uh, the, two, the two nurses you see above. Kristen, the shorter one, uh, did home infusion therapy for years. Tracy, who now is only working part-time with us because she got a phenomenal job uh, working in a cardiac cath lab at one of the local hospitals, but she still moonlights in our office. And Jessica, who's worked in another infusion center for many years. Danielle's my nurse practitioner, who's my right hand, takes good care of me. I know Christina met her up at the meeting at Stowe, Vermont, a few years ago. And we have these red flags for when people should go to the emergency room. They're pretty similar to the red flags that you saw earlier in this meeting about who you're going to work up. But for example, a thunderclap headache. If this is the first thunderclap headache a patient has, they belong in the emergency room. It's headaches that have changed really dramatically. Somebody who's over 50. And the most important reason for sending somebody to the emergency room, and I've added to Snoop, I've not added a Y for you guys down south, uh, y'all have no idea what's going on. Uh, that's one, perhaps one of the best reasons for going, sending somebody to the emergency room. And I had a picture of Snoopy there, actually, but my two, uh, my two dogs were a little jealous of me having Snoopy there. And they were staring at me just like that, so I took that picture and I put Dexter and Divot in the, uh, in the slide. And of course, we know how our patients come in sometimes. We want to send them, uh, send them home with a smile. And uh, I think most of the time we've been pretty successful with doing this. So. We want to have questions now, or? Uh... I want to say thank you. Um, we'll, we'll do a Q&A after. I'm okay. about to introduce Kathy, but that was amazing. And by the way, when I met my friends, I didn't meet them at a lecture. I didn't, eat, I didn't meet my friends at a lecture. I met them probably um, at a conference, and we were in the audience just watching everybody else. And so I rarely ever get to see them speak. And so the best part is, when I'm here, I, I'm too busy to actually listen to their entire lecture because I'm hurting cats. <laughs> but for the next month to a year, when I get bored at night, I just put them on. Like, I'm like, Nate is so smart. I was so smart. They're so smart. So anyway, thank you for the thank next year's worth of videos. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to do the drawing right now. And